times where he used to drop me off at school in like a nice little car. Footballer's car. Yeah, and he, he just pulled into like the playground. Everyone's like, you know, like all the younger kids. I mean, Ashley Cole, compare with Ashley Cole, Ashley Cole as a 9, 10 year old was a tremendous goal scorer. Mitchell was on the same level as him as a kid that age. He signed pro at West Ham, got a lovely contract, Put, signed on the pitch against Bolton. Yeah, yeah. There was a time when they announced it over the speakers at the school that he'd been picked for England. When he got to about 16, he was going to play for England. Yes. And he collapsed. We took him to the doctors and they come up with this heart condition. Hypertrophic. Hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. First time you ever heard those words, I guess. First time I've ever heard those words. Cardiomyopathy is an abnormality of heart muscle. So you have uh, a left heart and a right heart. So if you talk about the left heart, you can have thickening of the heart muscle. We call that hypertrophic, hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. Our aim is to get just the general term out there, because I think it's quite, the length of the word cardiomyopathy, it's a bit of a barrier. People think, okay, cardiac arrest or heart failure, but we really want to get the name out there and make people aware that they, there is a specific set of conditions. When he said, I'm going back playing, and play, I've got a contract at Great, yeah. what did you say? What did you think? What could I think, really? It was his life. So this is this is then where it all began for uh, for Mitchell Cole, it right is, here. Yeah. Yep, right here. Yep, raised here. Yeah, one of the last babies to be born in St. Bart's. Yeah, yeah. They closed it after after he was born. They closed it after he was born. Yeah. I hope not yeah. because of Mitchell. No, 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 no. You know, I mean, like when he grew and he he was a footballer, mm. but he would not have thought that from him when he was tiny. He was he was the sensitive one. Mm. You know, always held back. Ben Ben was the one that was there, you know, Ben had, Mitchell would stand back and watch to see if Ben did it first. Right. And then Mitchell would follow. You were close as, as siblings as well. Yeah, we were very close, yeah. A lot of sort of big brother banter. If you'd come out in a t-shirt, it was a bit sort of questionable, we'd be on you straight away. So the, the Alice fan would be in yeah, the Yeah, yeah, definitely. One day, I went to watch me and my uh, wife, and I went to Wales, and this was about one o'clock, I thought, oh, we've got plenty of time, mm. but I was in South Wales. So I ended up getting to Mitchell game 10 minutes from the end, and that's when he scored, got man and match. And I, didn't, I couldn't bring myself to say to Mitchell, oh, Mitchell. Yeah. But he said, Dad, weren't I great? I said, brilliant, Mitch. But, uh, Yeah, but that was a great day. Well, he was a piss taker. I remember, I remember he used to take the yeah, piss out of me a lot. Like, when I was yeah. younger, I didn't like him that much. <laughs> <laughs> when I was little, I remember taking the piss out of me. Nice, but yeah. <laughs> yeah. as you get older, obviously, you get, then you get on that level, yeah. then so you, you get the banter say, level. You can say something back to him. Yeah, <laughs> then you, you can chuck things as back. Much. But yeah, he was just a laugh. Like he would just come up with like witty one-liners and that. When were you aware of his talent? When he, Let's call it. when he was about four and a half. Four and a half. Yeah, we went to um, we went to Butlins, and a friend of ours said, "Oh, he can come play for my team." Mm. He, he had a good left foot on him. He was the star of the team, you know. Mm. School oh, teams and school teams, everything. Uh, yeah, district teams, everything. I mean, like people couldn't believe how he could take a corner at 12 years old. Mm -hmm. it, it'd be straight in the net. Let's say he did it like a man. Mitchell Cole signed for West Ham as a teenager, turned down Arsenal, scored at Wembley, and played in the same England team as Wayne Rooney. He was born and raised near Mitchell Street in North London. I saw Mitchell, we was playing for Islington's uh, primary schools against Tower Hamlets. So I was a Tower Hamlets primary school manager, and he was absolutely brilliant. What stood him out as a good player at that age? Well, he had a great touch, great enthusiasm, and um, good on the ball, confident, you know, and he was a very nippy, so a little left winger. When I took him to Chelsea, he had a trials uh, under Bernie Dixon, and um, West Ham were, were after him as well, but he decided to go to West Ham with uh, Jimmy Tindall um, and Jimmy Anson, because they were all the boys they were producing at the time. 
So I took um, Mitchell to America as well. I remember one time we was at a football tournament and uh, one of the coaches said he would give, buy Mitchell a pizza for every goal he scored and Mitchell scored 13 goals. So the guy bought 13 pieces which they all shared around with the kids. I think the great time was when I used to um, pick them two up from school and I used to take Mitchell to football training straight up the stand. About four o'clock we used to go McDonald's first. Yes. <laughs> Ideal pretty much. Yeah. 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 Oh, we had to have his little Mac burger first. And so then, we've got Mitchell here. Yeah, Mitchell there, and then Rooney there. We Perfect. can definitely recognise Rooney though. Yeah. yeah. One of his one of his former managers described him as every bit as good as Ryan Giggs when he was a, when he was a younger player. Yeah, that's who he used to get compared to a lot. 2008, so that's... When he got to about 16, he was going to play for England. Yes. And he collapsed. In early hours in the morning, mm. and I heard a bang, and I thought, what's that? And I went to push the door in the bathroom. I couldn't open. I said, "What's the matter, Mitch?" Then, then when I opened the door, he's just getting up. He said, "Oh, I just slipped." He didn't tell me he had a seizure. Anyway, he cut his head open. Uh, well, I just cut his head. We had to put glass on. Yeah, we yeah. went down to the football, and I said, "What's the matter, Mitch?" He said, "I'll oh, just hit me head as I was right here on the Come cupboard." The and otherwise, they wouldn't let him play. We took him to the doctors. We wanted him checked, uh, and then they come up with. It was Valentine's Day and they come up with this heart condition. He was 15, 16. It was hypertrophic? Hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. First time you ever heard those words, I guess? First time I've ever heard those words. I went home and Googled it. Cried my eyes out. A sudden cardiac death is a tragic and shocking event. It leaves behind devastated family members, friends, and in the case of a talented young footballer, his fans too. But what is sudden cardiac death? Why does it appear so common in football? And is there anything to prevent it? So we're just going to start doing the cardiac screening today and what we're going to be doing here. Professor John Sumaru is a consultant cardiologist and a specialist in inherited cardiac conditions, or cardiomyopathies. He's a member of the FA's cardiac screening panel and is the cardiologist to Liverpool Football Club. He also works with British Cycling, where today he is conducting a cardiac screening with double Olympic gold medalist Philip Hines. What is cardiomyopathy? Cardiomyopathy is an abnormality of heart muscle. So you have uh, a left heart and a right heart. So if you talk about the left heart, you can have thickening of the heart muscle, and we call that hypertrophic, hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, and that's the one seen in one in 500 of the population. Uh, or you can have a problem where the heart muscle is actually thinned and the whole chamber of the heart, the left ventricle, gets much bigger and poorly functioning. We call that a dilated cardiomyopathy. Are you born with it? You're not actually born with the condition, but you may well have a gene, and one of the genes may well express itself later in life, and it may well express itself around the times of puberty, going into uh, you know, 14, 15, 16 onwards, and that's a, a, a time that we would tend to start screening people. That's when you, you may well pick up this condition. So you may not be born with it, but you're born with a preponderance to develop it because you've got the genetic profile. Mitchell's talent brought him to the attention of all of London's big clubs. He eventually signed terms at West Ham, where he was involved in the first team's pre-season, alongside the likes of Jermaine Defoe, Mark Noble and Michael Carrick. After it was confirmed that Mitchell had a hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, he was told that he couldn't play for West Ham. They offered to pay Mitchell for the duration of his contract, but he opted to leave. So then he sat around for eight months, not doing anything. Can he put on a little bit of weight and, you know, went out drinking a bit, was binging, just he didn't know where his life was going. Yeah. Yeah. He was going out with, um, obviously, Charlie, Joe Cole's sister. Yeah. Went on holiday with them, and they bumped into the Grays manager, Grays athletic manager. Mm. Stimson, is it? It was Mickey Woodward. He Mickey owned, Woodward. yeah, Mickey Woodward. He owned Grays athletic okay. at the time. So he said, bring him down. So he went down, signed straight away. Loved it. Star of the show he was. Mitchell had got his career on track. He moved up from non-league with Grays athletic to League One and the championship with South End. A loan spell at Northampton Town preceded a move to Stevenage Borough. When he said, I'm going back playing, I'm playing I've got a contract at Great, yeah. what did you say? What did you think? What could I think, really? It was his life. He was entitled to live it yeah. how he wanted to. And, and he had a smile on his face. By becoming athletic, you will put some huge stresses on your heart. And uh, we've seen from some of the, the screenings that we've done that we find that all chambers of the heart get very big. And also the muscle wall gets thicker as well. In general, it's around one per 100,000 uh, 
uh, athletes will potentially have a, a serious event. Um, now, if you actually start playing sports and you have a pre-existing condition, then it actually may well treble or even quadruple your risk. Would you say this is the, the highlight, the career highlight? The FA Trophy, yeah, definitely. Oh, no. Scoring at Wembley, the new Wembley. Tell us a little bit about um, that, that day at Wembley. Oh, the 2 0 down at half time, I thought, yeah, we might not get back into this. But there was England and me, I thought, now nah, there's something special here in that. And Mitchell got the first goal, which was uh, which got us back into it. And then obviously Dobbo scored, and then Morrison in the 89th minute wins it for us. And now to so come back from 2 0 down and win 3 2, it, it was truly a momentous day for us. One of the best days in my personal uh, life as supporters of English. Young players, professional footballers, and even those who have left the official training systems are at increased risk of dying suddenly from an underlying heart condition. That's according to a recently published 10-year study carried out by the FA alongside Cardiac Risk in the Young. The study analysed around 11,000 young players aged 16 to 17. The uh, scholars of that age are screened, they have that questionnaire, the ECG and the heart scan done. Potentially, now that we've seen our data, we would suggest, and is now going to be implemented, that at two years later, the age of 18, and again at the age of 20, and again at the age of 25, to have the questionnaire and the ECG done. So pop your arms down by your side, just as relaxed as you can get. One in 266, that's 42 players, were diagnosed with a condition associated with young sudden cardiac death such as hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. Almost three quarters were able to return to play, showing that a diagnosis during screening does not have to mean the end of a sporting career. Does screening catch everything? Screening won't catch everything. And again, in our study, we did find uh, that there were a group of athletes. Uh, there were uh, six athletes uh, who died who previously had had uh, normal cardiac screening. So of the 11,000 athletes, there were those six that died who previously had screening. Five of those died of a, a cardiomyopathy, a, a, a heart problem. One we're unsure as to why he died, probably a rhythm problem. So they had the cardiac screening done. Now you could argue that we've missed a screening, but if you think about it, the screening was done at the age of 16, and some of those actually died about 11 years later. The mean age of death after screening was about seven years. So in answer to your question, screening probably did pick up the conditions early on, and if we had repeated the screening every two or four years, we may well have picked up those other people as well. After helping Stevenage to promotion, Mitchell was back in league football, signing for Oxford United in 2010. But over time, his condition worsened. By that stage, Mitchell had a young family of his own and wasn't prepared to risk his life for the professional game. You know, he played a few games, I think, and then he struggled to get in the team. He wasn't feeling fit then? I no, he wasn't either. feeling fit. He was getting more and more out of breath. Yeah. And that's when he, he got a bit frightened because they showed him. The progression of the Yeah, yeah. yeah and I think then he realised that he had to give up professional football. But he still couldn't leave the ball alone. And he was at Arsley, he was in the bar after the game when he, when he saw Fabrice Mwamba collapse. And he decided then, that's it, he couldn't even play that football anymore. You never going to set foot on a pitch again? Couldn't even play that football anymore. But he used to come down here on a Friday night with your cousins. Yeah go over the leisure centre, have a kick about. It was sort of a combination of my friends all over and now it's yeah. It and that, just got expanded bigger. Everyone loved it. And then after, we'd all go back to the pub after and have a piss <laughs> up. <laughs> so. it, it, yeah. it was a win-win situation, but you're still in your football staff, so it, it was good. Yeah, all smelly it. and sweaty. <laughs> There's a smelly, sweaty pub anyway, so it's fine, <laughs> they let us in. I don't know if you want to talk about it, but what do you remember about, the, about that evening? Do you know what I remember? It was freezing. He'd come home, have all the Christmas trees up. He's come up, he's had his bit of banter with Ben as they do. He's left the house, quarter to, quarter to eight I think it was. Mitchell Cole died on Friday the 30th of November 2012, on the very same pitch he first played on as a child, just a few metres from the house he was raised in. And then I see everyone crowding, and then it was just... It was just weird, isn't it? It was like, it obviously you go it's over, it's like all... slow motion yeah. sort of thing. It was like, you didn't want to say, because I actually, because I was at the other end, and I was like, oh, what's going on? Did you know um, of his trouble? Yeah. yeah. Did you ever think, like, today could be the day when he... Oh, it happened to... 100%. Like, you, you never know when it's, say, it's your last game, but as, as a condition of his, 
you don't sort of say expect it because you, you don't want to fear the worst. Yeah, yeah I don't think you, you sit there thinking about it the whole like, time. Oh, is he like, obviously, you, you'll think about it, but you won't sit there he thinking, does. oh my God, he's running. Should he be running? Do you know what I mean? Because he wasn't actually like, he wouldn't be like springing up, down, up. No, what he'd do is he'd run and then you'd see him sort of take a break. Break, yeah. Like, that's that's how he yeah. played, isn't it? He'd get his breath back and then he'd get the ball, he'd go, dip, 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 bam, like, score. Five, eight side pitches are not that big. Did he, was he conscious after that? No. No. So when the heart that's gone into an abnormal rhythm is left in an abnormal rhythm, you don't get blood to your brain. So within three minutes, you'll be brain dead. You'll have irreversible brain damage unless you can restart the heart. So if you can apply one of these AEDs and it automatically shocks the heart back to a normal rhythm, you may well restore the blood supply having now got a normal rhythm and you can perfuse the brain. Now, you have to do that in combination with cardiopulmonary resuscitation or CPR at the same time. And it's been shown that if you do the two together, you can increase the chance of survival from just CPR at 5%. CPR plus defibrillators can be 50%. You can increase survival. However, there's a, a few downsides here. So if you delay the time at which you introduce a defibrillator, by nine minutes, it's only 10% survival. Whereas if you can do it within one minute, it's 90% survival. So the most important thing here, the key here is timing. Ben didn't play with you that night. Oh, ben didn't play. Yeah, he had, off. he had that night off. The one night he had off. <laughs> I had one missed call from my cousin. He just said, look, Ben, like, I think you should come down. And, um, I was like, yeah, okay, like, what's, like, what's happened? He was like, oh, right, no, nothing to worry he about. He didn't give you the... No, no, he was like, no, there's nothing, nothing to worry about. Just come down, Mitchell's like, we called an ambulance, Mitchell's like, collapsed. Um, and then as I got there, like, all the ambulances are there. Well, ambulance. Yeah, we've got, we've got to the hospital. We've got him out, rushed him into resus, and, uh, I was literally the only one there because obviously the ambulance straight through was there and um, there's working on him for about five, ten minutes and yeah, then one of the doctors just come over with maybe like the readouts of, of his heart and stuff and um, yeah, just told me the news and yeah, just obviously didn't know what to do so I've just I was obviously there on my own been told this news on my own but in me when I found out I didn't want to be there when everyone else found out that makes sense because I knew especially my mum by quarter past eight, Ben rang me and said, have you heard from anybody? I said, no. Are oh, you were still in the house? Then? Yeah. He said, Mitchell's collapsed. So we come running around here, the ambulance was here and whatever. That was it. Yeah. And when you hear it, it's collapsed, I mean. Yeah, that was my worst nightmare. Before Mitchell passed away, he became involved with raising awareness of hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. He appeared extensively on TV and radio in the UK and went to the United States, sharing his story. The Mitchell Cole Memorial Tournament is now in its sixth year and organised by Stevenage fan group leader Keith Bell, as well as Ben Cole. Ben has also run the London Marathon and climbed Kilimanjaro for Cardiomyopathy UK. What made uh, Mitchell uh, a player uh, that was worthy of, of honouring uh, with a tournament? Um, well, obviously, like with the like, heart condition and all that, it's something that like, we could like do for charity and all that and plus as well Mitchell gave us some really good times at Borough I mean like scoring at Wembley in the first ever uh, final there and yeah just plenty of memories in the Borough shirt and football in general to be honest with you. Does this mean a lot to, to you boys though? We've been here how many years? Well we've been here every, <laughs> yeah. every year. Every year. Every year. Not we've watched, yeah. Take the trophy home for Mitchell? Hopefully, Hopefully yeah. We, can't, we can't. did it the first year. Yeah. Well, and the then, year when I scored, we needed, uh, I think it was a, a win, and I scored the last goal in the last second. Yeah, make it about you. Uh, I'm just saying, to lift the trophy for Richard. This is what this day is about, it's to raise awareness, to raise some good money for a fantastic cause.
We had a really successful media campaign last year called um, My Heart Story. So we were really encouraging people to know their heart history, know if there are any heart issues in the family, in, you know, back in the generations, and for people to be aware of that and if they need to get tested, to get tested. Um, because basically we, we want to be there from the point of diagnosis. So if someone comes out of the, of the room where they've just been diagnosed, we want to be there for them to catch them because it's a, it's a tough diagnosis. And if you look on Google, it's going to tell you you've got five years to live max. And that's not the case. And we want, to, we want people to live the most fulfilling life they can. Seven days after Mitchell Cole died, his youngest daughter was born. And his brother and his friends and his cousins were back at the same pitch that he died on. They did not want their last memory of their Friday night game together to be the one of Mitchell dying. He started playing his first game when he was like six years old on that pitch, kicking about. And that's where, that's where he ended his life, really. You know, not in the ambulance, not in the hospital, on that pitch. He just had his 27th birthday. You know, he travelled the world. He just, you know, he went and stayed at Sean Goat's house in Bermuda. When well, he's playing for England C down there, yeah. yeah. He had a great, he had a great life. He had, he had a short life, but he had a great life.